Will the Committee of Supply please come to order? This section of the Committee of Supply will now resume consideration of the estimates for the Department of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Questioning for this department will continue in a global manner. The floor is now open for questions. The Honorable Member for Flin Flon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I think we ended off yesterday. I had asked the Minister a question about forestry. Uh, so I think that's probably where we will pick up uh, this year. Does the Minister have information on the number of trees that were planted last year? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in the last planting season, which was last spring and summer, I guess, uh, Manitoba planted 1,651,035 seedlings. Um, and, and that's up from the previous year, where we planted one, just over 1.5 million. Now that, that includes the trees planted by, by Manitoba and our contractors, uh, which uh, the Pegwas First Nation was one of our contractors in terms of planting there. Um, we also have industry planting trees and we don't have the final numbers for 2022 yet, but uh, CKP in the Paw and uh, LP at Swan River. In 2021, they planted 3.6 million trees. So we expect those numbers to be relatively close for 2022. They're just compiling those numbers now and haven't sent them to us yet. The Honourable Member for Flint Flon. Can the Minister tell us how many trees were cut down or otherwise lost in like forest fires, <laughs> things like that?
The Honorable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, our, our department doesn't uh, report on number of trees. It's by uh, area and volume uh, harvested. So these are preliminary numbers for 22-23. We think they're pretty close, but they're not completely final yet. We harvested uh, trees over 7,976 hectares of land across Manitoba. And uh, the companies harvested uh, 1,116,579 cubic meters. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. So, we keep track of the number of trees we plant and we keep track of the area of trees that are lost. So, can the Minister explain how we know if we're keeping up with the number of trees lost as opposed to the number of trees planted? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to try to convey the information I was just told. Um, again, uh, we, we set limits of harvest by geographical areas based on the ecological capacity of the forests in those areas. And that becomes annual allowable limits for forest companies to cut. Um, so from 2016 to 2020, over 27 million trees were planted throughout Manitoba, and 80,000 hectares received certificates of forest renewal. That's ensuring that, that, that those forests have trees planted in order to renew what they had harvested. So we, I guess the bottom line is we are planting more trees than we're harvesting but we don't have a number of trees we're harvesting, just cubic meters and volume. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. I'll have to digest all that and then maybe come back to that for further clarification. Uh, and maybe the Minister needs further clarification too as we go. So, uh, um, so can the Minister tell us if his department is currently in talks to sign more revenue sharing agreements with any of the Indigenous Communities First Nations?
the Honorable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So just for a little background here, in April of 2022, uh, the Department of Natural Resources and Northern Development uh, began negotiations with uh, First Nations in Manitoba here towards a uh, pilot timber to use revenue sharing agreement. Um, the mandate uh, our department had uh, was to allow for up to 45% of timber to use revenue to be shared under the agreements. So in, in after year one, um, we, well, in year one, we focused on uh, areas with large uh, forestry operations as well, or, or at the time, and with long-term uh, licenses depend, uh, pending. So we, we total of two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. We we offered uh, a revenue sharing agreement to thirteen First Nations. Um, and uh, to date, we've signed six, seven MOUs. We've signed six agreements. So the MOU precedes the memorandum of agreements. So seven MOUs, six agreements. Um, we've also um, had discussions with uh, two other First Nations. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing back from them. Um, Again, this is something that's uh, certainly not forced upon First Nations. It's, uh, it's sharing timber dues with First Nations as a, as a sign of reconciliation, uh, recognition that uh, these trees were harvested on their traditional territories. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Can the Minister tell us what First Nations he's got signed agreements with and which ones are still waiting. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Certainly I'd be happy to share the information of the ones we've signed uh, uh, agreements with. It, it's public information and uh, I think they're very proud of the fact that uh, they signed with us. Uh, where possible, we were up at their First Nations and were welcomed with open arms, uh, had some ceremonies and things like that, and treated to some good hospitality and food while we were up there. So uh, we're looking forward to signing more. So uh, agreements we signed is uh, with Chemawawan Cree Nation. Do you want me to go slow so you can write? <laughs> uh, Opaskawayak Cree Nation. Uh, Minago Zibi and Inabe. Mosa Kahayikan Cree Nation. I know you'll know the spelling of all these too, so. <laughs> Sapatawayak Cree Nation. Wesque Sipic, First Nation. That should be the six that we signed MOUs and MOAs with. Um, we have an MOU signed with uh, uh, the Norway House Cree Nation. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Uh, the Minister said in his previous answer that you had seven signed MOUs. Yeah. So, so far you've given us the name of one of them. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to be clear that with the, with the six that you wrote down there, the first six, we signed MOUs, Memorandum of Understanding. We did more discussions with them, hammered out the Memorandum of Agreement, which was the triggering document to, um, to send the uh, timber dues to those First Nations. So there's six that have signed both. Norway House, Cree Nation has just signed the MOU at this point. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Thank you for that. My misunderstanding. Which uh, 
nations have you not got any kind of MOUs or signed agreements with? The Honorable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as I indicated in one of my other answers, there was 13. And uh, I think the member will appreciate the, those 13 nations are basically in, in the north and west of Manitoba, where a lot of the work is being done on traditional lands. So uh, I'd be happy to give him the other, uh, the names of the other six uh, if he'd like to write them down. We've, we've sent them letters, we've followed up with letters. Um, we're having ongoing discussions with some of them. Um, and uh, you know, we, we certainly, it's, it's our intent to sign uh, MOUs and MOAs with any First Nation that wants to sign with us. But again, it's, it's, it's no pressure. It's uh, tailoring the MOU and the MOA to, uh, to their liking as well. I mean, our offer is to share revenue dues if they have some other things in there that they, uh, wording that they don't like or whatever. We're always open to, uh, to, to changing wording and things to ensure that our, our, um, our First Nations are satisfied with anything before they sign it. So, are you ready to go? We got the Matthias Colomb Cree Nation. Misipatowistic Cree Nation. Nisi Chewaisik Cree Nation, Pimachikamak Cree Nation, Sagig First Nation, and this is a tough one, Tutineo Wazibig Treat Reserve, TTR for short. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, so we've talked about some revenue sharing agreements in regards to forestry. Has there been any discussion on revenue sharing agreements with any other resource things particular to First Nations communities? Mineral, one thing and the other. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, we're certainly uh, interested in expanding our revenue sharing on uh, timber dues with um, 
you know, First Nations in the interlake, the eastern area of Manitoba here moving forward. Um, it's an encouragement to them as well to, to help support the, the forest industries that might want to establish in those areas if, if they know that the, they're, they're, they got some economic benefit coming back to them besides, besides the jobs and uh, things like that. So um, as, a, as a member will know, I'm, my department is not responsible for mining anymore, so I certainly can't speak to mining. I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, I think uh, this model has shown that uh, it works. And it's uh, certainly been appreciated by every First Nation that I've met and talked to about this. And, uh, you know, I want to say that I have a great relationship with all these chiefs uh, and councils now and, uh, you know, have their personal cell phones on speed dial. It's kind of nice to be able to talk to them ab about common concerns as well. And, uh, you know, a lot of these First Nations are considering how they're going to lose their, how they're going to use their timber to use money, whether it's for economic development or for the good of their their citizens. I mean, they're always looking for jobs uh, for their for their uh, people, and um, and a lot of them have uh, thoughts of uh, you know creating businesses and things like that to help support the forest industry. So we're really excited by this, and we think it's a model that uh, you know it's I, like I said to them, it, it's been a long time coming. It should have happened before, but it's happening now. And I think that uh, Manitoba is being recognized on the national stage here for what we're doing in terms of, of sharing with our First Nations. So I'm very proud of the work our forestry department's done and our government's done in terms of uh, recognizing the fact that we need to share, share revenues with First Nations uh, on their traditional lands. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. So one of the things in uh, the uh, estimates book for your department uh, under key initiatives is to continue to support the drafting and development of mineral development consultation protocol agreements with First Nations in Manitoba. So is the minister now saying that that's not his department or is, is it just that that hasn't been done yet? Is someone doing it? Is it fallen off the map? What's happening with that? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So when the reorganization happened in uh, February of this year and um, mining moved over to economic development, investment and trade, um, parks came into natural resources. But what, what was left with us was the consultation unit that, that works with First Nations in terms of uh, you know, doing work on consultation and things with First Nations. So that unit under our department still works, does work for edit in terms of the mining industry. But NRND does not have the mining industry under our portfolio. You would have to talk to Minister Wharton in estimates about mining and what their plans are moving forward in terms of any type of revenue sharing in mining you know, when mines are eventually built here in Manitoba on traditional territories. So what I'm saying is our consultation unit supports the work of NRND in terms of consultation with, uh, you know, fish, wildlife, forestry, things like that, and also supports edit in terms of mining. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Well, that seems somewhat confusing. The consultation unit is part of your department, 
but you only consult on some things, not on others. It's, you don't consult on on mineral uh, uh, revenue sharing agreements or anything. To the, somebody else does that. Is is that what I'm understanding? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess the easiest way to explain it is the consultation unit is shared between EDIT and NRND, but the consultation unit falls under my purview. But they do work for the mining sector under EDIT, which is not under my control at all. Nothing to do with mining is, is I'm, re I'm not responsible for anything. But if we need to consult with First Nations on forestry, wildlife, anything like that, we call on the consultation unit. If EDIT needs to consult on mining, needs to have them consult with First Nations, that unit's at their disposal as well. That unit had to be put somewhere. It had to be under some minister. It was under my ministry. It stayed here. So uh, like I say, the mining, the mining branch moved over to EDIT in the February uh, reorganization. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. This question may be above above the minister's pay grade, but uh, why did mining go from the resource development uh, portfolio to something else? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. I think the member's likely correct. It was above my pay grade. <laughs> but I think it, it certainly made sense. Um, moving forward, uh, mining is, is much more than uh, just exploration and things, and it's going to need uh, plenty of horsepower to develop mining in the north, and I think it's better suited under economic development. We worked hand-in-hand -hand with economic development anyways when, when I had mining. And I think moving over there was a natural fit. And in return, uh, you know, we received parks, which I think was a natural fit into, into natural resources. So it's, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I guess, a marriage made in heaven. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Well, apparently it was a marriage made somewhere. <laughs> So uh, just one more question, I think, on the forestry end of things. Uh, well, maybe a couple. What about uh, peatlands? Does that fall under this ministry, or is that somewhere else? So if peatlands is part of this ministry, how many consultations have you had, and are there any MOUs in place, particularly with uh, First Nations on peatlands development?
the Honorable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, we are responsible for peatlands here in Manitoba. Um, the Peatland Stewardship Act was recently proclaimed. Um, you know, as, as the member likely knows, you know, most of the, the peat production is in the Interlake or Eastern Manitoba here. And there hasn't been a lot of industry expansion over the years. I mean, it's certainly a, a product that we do produce in Manitoba and we do export as well. Um, you know, if, if there is any expansion on this, you know, so we certainly have a duty to consult with, uh, with our First Nations on any, uh, any expansion of the industry there. Um, what we have done is uh, put in place a couple of provincially significant peatlands, protecting them so that there's uh, you know, no harvesting of peatland in those areas. We've worked with uh, Waska Sipic uh, First Nation on, on the one. Oh, yeah. Uh, which is called Muswa Meadows, Meadows. And, um, and the other one that we've protected recently or, or deemed a provi provincially significant peatland and it has protections is Fish Lake Fen. So the, these peatlands have the ability to store carbon and are a very important uh, part of our um, ecological network here in Manitoba, I guess. The Honourable Member for Flint Flon. So I assume from the Minister's answer then there's no plan to enter into any kind of discussion about uh, revenue sharing with existing peatland operations only if there's some expansion of peatland operations? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm certainly learning a lot about peatlands uh, in the last little while. Uh, I, I focused, as you can see, I focused on forestry a lot and then mining in my first uh, eight months as minister. So peatlands are kind of, uh, you know, something that I'm, I'm getting familiar with here and I hope to go out to some peatlands this spring and just see how, how they work. and. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. I've lived in Manitoba 65 years and I've never been to a peatland. So it's gonna be an eye opener for me, I think. So uh, I just wanna tell you about a few companies we have here in Manitoba. We got SunGrow, we got Tetro, we got Rhymer, we got FPM, we got Jiffy, we got Burger, we got Sunterra, and we got Lambert. We got all those companies here in Manitoba. And uh, you know, in 2022, I guess uh, total uh, volume was uh, 1,548,149 cubic meters of peat. Now that would fill a lot of garden centers, I imagine, with uh, bags of, of peat moss, right? As you can appreciate, uh, I'm, I'm sure the member for Flin Flon's a gardener, likely in his spare time up there, and likely buys some of this good Manitoba product from time to time. So, but you know, Manitoba only got a total of $167,200 in royalties off of all that peat. 
So, uh, I mean, we, you know, we're certainly not against sharing revenues moving forward. I mean, I think that's something that's open for discussion, especially as the industry expands and uh, First Nations may perhaps get more involved in this on their traditional territories and things like that. So, you know, again, it's, uh, I mean, it's, the volume is significant. The royalties Manitoba collects really isn't at this point. So, uh, in fact, I was, I was talking to my staff and saying, you know, it likely just pays for our, our staff people basically these royalties so you know we're looking at expanding the industry where possible and uh, I guess any, everything's on the table the honorable member for Flint Flon so then the answer is there's no plan to have any kind of uh, revenue sharing discussions with any First Nations upon whose land some of these existing peat operations presently exist The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. I, I think I just said that everything's on the table and uh, I certainly, uh, you know, that's certainly that uh, we'll, we'll consult with and, and decide what we're going to do. We've been uh, certainly, we got our, we, we got a good start in forestry here and uh, there's certainly, uh, um, you know, there's certainly uh, an opportunity here moving forward that we'll investigate and uh, we'll work with our First Nation partners and uh, uh, like I say, everything's on the table. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Uh, I do believe, let me just check, uh, what's current vacancy rate uh, within the Forestry and Peatlands Division of your department? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the current uh, full-time equivalent vacancies is, sits at 14. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. So there's currently 14 vacancies. What's the total complement of full-time equivalents? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, the 23-24 uh, budget estimates show that there's 46 full-time equivalents in forestry and peatlands. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Has that 46 number been constant over the last few years or has the budgeted number of workers in that department gone down, gone up? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Year over year, the 46, number, the 46 number has remained consistent. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. I thank the Minister for that. So just one quick question before we leave forestry. Where does the province procure all the seedlings that it uses?
The Honorable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I'm told here that we put it out to open tender back in, I guess, 2022, and a company by the name of PRT um, won the tender, a five-year tender. Um, a lot of their trees are grown in Saskatchewan and come here into Manitoba. Um, I think it's important that we had a long-term contract for trees. As you know, uh, you know we, we entered into an agreement with the uh, federal government too as part of the Two Billion Trees Initiative here in Canada where we'll be planting trees, uh, working in conjunction with municipalities and hopefully the city of Winnipeg and things like that in terms of planting trees as well. So we need a certainty of tree, tree supply because uh, a lot of other jurisdictions in Canada want trees too. So we thought it advisable to go out to tender and uh, I, I'm pleased that we have a five-year tender and we'll have supplies until 2027. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Once upon a time, the Manitoba government owned a uh, tree nursery that this government privatized into oblivion because it no longer produces anything. Is there some reason why it was felt that getting rid of a provincially owned entity that grew trees when we have a commitment to plant more trees, why was it gotten rid of and now we're forced to tender to other jurisdictions? supply, employment, income, and everything else to other province entities. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. I think if the member wants to tar start talking about privatizing here, maybe he could explain to me as well if I gave him an answer on why he decided to privatize the property registry under the previous NDP government. Houses are still being sold, land is still being transacted in Manitoba. Obviously, it was a business decision at that point, I assume, unless the member wants to give me an answer for that. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. It's unfortunate that the Minister takes exception to questions about privatizing things. I get that previous governments also privatized uh, things like the, the Minister's uh, alluded to. However, those jobs are still in Manitoba. In this case, the minister's government privatized an entity that shut down, produces absolutely no revenue for Manitoba, provides absolutely no jobs for Manitoba, and instead contracts out what could have been a very good business in Manitoba, privatizes it, contracts it out, to an out-of-province entity that hires workers not in this province, pays taxes not in this province, the workers pay taxes not in this province. How, how does that make a business sense looking at what the government wants to do or claims to want to do around economic development? This seems to be completely the opposite. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think the, um, the member will know that I was not the minister when there was any decision to, um, to um, not continue to move forward with the Pineland Nursery here in eastern Manitoba. It's my understanding that, uh, you know, there was a lot of capital expenditures that would be needed to keep that operation going when, when we came into government in 2016. And, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, it was inefficient and we decided that, uh, you know, the right way would be to go to market, make sure we had a certainty of supply. Um, and, of course, the member knows that, uh, you know, we can't uh, just put out tenders here in Manitoba and give preference to Manitoba suppliers. We're in a worldwide marketplace here. We're part of the New West Partnership. Uh, I mean, it's required that uh, tenders go out to any suppliers, and, uh, you know, Manitoba, Manitoba suppliers could bid on this contract as well. So uh, the tendering doesn't preclude anybody from bidding. It was so happened that PRT uh, um, uh, won the contract and uh, uses trees from Saskatchewan. Our department's very happy with the certainty of supply to ensure we have trees to fulfill our obligations to our First Nations and to the federal government as part of the $2 billion tree initiative. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. To my way of thinking, and I understand the Minister wasn't the Minister at the time that some of these decisions got made, but would it not have made more sense to invest some in an existing resource that we had here, potentially even create a business opportunity for some First Nations to expand what was there previously so that a, a made in Manitoba uh, solution could have been found even within the confines of the New West Partnership that I'll point out to the Minister that it was his government that signed on to the New West Partnership, uh, which is one of the things that previous government was concerned about was the loss of jobs that would come along with that and, and now here's a prime example of that. Would it not have made more sense to do the economic development in Manitoba for Manitobans to create jobs, to create wealth, to create everything that we need in Manitoba? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it, it's good to, rec good to hear the member recognize the New West Partnership because I remember, I don't know if it was him, but a lot of his colleagues back there in 16 or 17 were indicating that it didn't even exist. Now the member has said today that uh, the previous government was concerned about signing on to it. So obviously it did exist, so I'm, I'm pleased that he's acknowledged it today. I think the, the New West Partnership works, uh, works all three ways here in, in, uh, in the prairies because, uh, you know, Manitoba firms can bid on contracts in Saskatchewan. There's no preference giving to certain provinces. I think it's a wide open, you know, Western Canadian market now for products. And uh, we're helping each other as neighbours in terms of, uh, you know, the contracts that are won in each provinces. So, and again, you know, I wasn't privy to discussions on the, uh, on the nursery at the time. And, uh, you know, I just know that I'm sure a lot of due diligence went into that decision before it was made. And uh, a lot of things were considered. Um, so, I mean, we're talking history now. That's five or six years ago. Uh, our forestry service has moved on and uh, signed contracts here that ensure that we have trees today, tomorrow, and into the future. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Can the Minister tell us what all other private entities put in uh, for this tendered uh, position of planting or supplying trees? Was there any? Manitoba entities that, that were part of that process?
The Honorable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think that, uh, you know, when, when bids are put out here in Manitoba, they go out through our procurement arm, through uh, consumer protection and government services. That might be a better question to ask them at estimates in terms of, uh, you know, um, if, if, if you want to know the bidders on certain contracts. I think it's a, it's a question for Minister Teitzma when you have estimates in, uh, with CPGS. I would just like to remind all members that we must refer to uh, members by their title or their constituency. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Thank you. I can't say that I'm exactly satisfied with that answer that the Minister seems to know that a company from Saskatchewan won the tender but can't tell me if there was any Manitoba companies actually in the process. Can't tell me if, if there were any other companies in the process. I mean, that's, it's, it's somewhat lacking that answer, I'm sorry to say. That uh, I had hoped that maybe the minister, maybe another day, can provide uh, more clarity on, on that particular question. But for now, I think we'll shift over and talk some about parks. So my first question is, does the minister plan to raise park fees? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I certainly had an easy answer for that, but I wanted to uh, remind the member of the December 22nd news release that was issued by our government. I don't know if he has a copy of that there. Um, if so, he can go back in like we just did and find it. Uh, the fourth paragraph, this is talking about the, uh, the travel uh, Manitoba report uh, that we commissioned MNP to do on provincial parks with it comes with lots of recommendations and things, but uh, the previous uh, minister um, has a basic, uh, I guess you can quote him here in the fourth paragraph. He says, the Manitoba government is not considering any changes to park entry and camping fees at this time. Um, further to, be, to that, I'm gonna say to be clear, parks fees are not going up this year. Uh, the parks evaluation study was received by government, but hasn't been endorsed or promoted as policy yet. And, uh, you know, we, we've certainly been consistent all along that there's no changes to camping or park entry fees. Um, but what the Travel Manitoba study does show is that Manitobans enjoy less expensive access to parks than in many other jurisdictions here across Canada. The Honourable Member for Flint Flon. 
So the minister talked about uh, things like entry and camping fees. Will there be any increase in other fees? Or will there be fees charged for other things that are presently free in the parks? New chair. The Honorable Minister of Natural Resources and Living Development. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, uh, I don't know what the, the member's getting at by any other rates or things like that. I mean, we have park entry fees, we have camping fees, we have commercial le lease fees for our operators there. There's no changes to commercial lease rates. Um, I think the member will note that last week we signed a, a very important MOU with uh, Manitoba Provincial Parks Cottage Owners Association, which represents 6,200 members here across Canada. Uh, certainly exciting to sign that uh, MOU with them that will take a look at uh, working in collaboration with them in terms of uh, figuring out uh, fair and, and transparent uh, um, lease fees, service fees, things like that moving forward. And again, I say in collaboration, this isn't a top-down approach. This is working together with them. That's what that MOU uh, signifies. Um, the, the current uh, lease deal, I guess, expired a couple years ago. And uh, in the interim, we did increase their fees by 2% a year in 21 and 22. Um, this year, uh, with the signing of the MOUs, we've frozen the rates so that uh, we can certainly discuss with them in good faith moving forward what should be done uh, in terms of uh, lease fees for properties in provincial parks and for uh, service fees like uh, garbage collection um, you know water or sewer things like that so i'm uh, very excited to work with this fine group of individuals at mppcoa um, they're always uh, they're open to discussions and uh, they understand that uh, you know uh, they, they love the park, obviously. They have their, you know, seasonal residents, sometimes full-time residences in the park. And uh, so, uh, like I say, we look forward to working with them over the next little while to, to come to an agreement that's uh, satisfactory to both parties. The member from Flin Flon. One of the things that I know, particularly in the north, we've seen in the last couple of years is firewood used to be supplied free of charge in the parks in the north. Now there's a fee attached. You have to pay for firewood. So are there other things like that that the minister's department is contemplating charging fees for? And is there any sense that that is spread throughout the entire province or is that specific to northern Manitoba? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, our, our park fees, like I said, are certainly amongst the lowest in Canada. I think that uh, 
uh, so-called FIPA document you gave me the other day reflected that. I think uh, that uh, the, the FIPA of the public document showed that <laughs> that these fees were pretty low, and uh, you know I think for I think the member was uh, maybe misleading the house a little bit there in terms of uh, saying we were going to do increases to park fees and things where all it was showing was a differential between the average in Canada and what we charge. So. You know, we certainly want to keep our park fees as low as possible to encourage more Manitobans to visit our provincial parks. And, uh, you know, that, that's our goal moving forward. Uh, we're looking forward to, uh, you know, to uh, budgeting more money for repairs and infrastructures in, in our infrastructure in parks to provide more opportunities for Manitobans to get out and enjoy the parks uh, moving forward. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. And I guess one of the other things that was in that uh, uh, Freedom of Information uh, that I tabled in the House the other day and in the actual report itself that I read when it uh, was publicly available was, and don't quote me, this is not a direct quote, but it, it uh, talked about fees being competitive with private parks, which the minister would probably agree that uh, private parks, private entities are there specifically to make money so they charge more. Is, is it the intent of this government, of this department, to change fees for various things, whether it's park entry, campsites, yurts, rentals, cabin rentals, any of those other things we've talked about? Is it is it the intent, as was alluded to in that report, to make those fees competitive, in quotation marks, with the private system? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think, uh, you know, any good government would, would be uh, remiss if they didn't uh, do their due diligence and, uh, you know, take a look at other jurisdictions across Canada, look at private entities and things to see what they're doing in the private space compared to the public space. And I think that's what that report from Travel Manitoba indicates is that, uh, you know, Manitoba's camping fees, uh, various fees in there are much lower than some jurisdictions and uh, I guess lower than the Canadian average. And that's why you commission reports to take a look at things like that. And uh, there's much more in the report though than uh, just talking about fees. There's certainly, it talks about opportunities and things moving forward. So, you know, we're gonna digest that report and uh, take a look at it. I think you're gonna see some, you know, a lot of good news here over the next few weeks uh, coming into parks. And uh, I think that what our goal is, is to ensure that we have the best possible experience for, for Manitobans. And, and indeed Canadians or U.S. visitors that come to Manitoba that they can explore our beautiful parks and ensure we have the infrastructure, uh, campsites, yurts and things like that available when people want them because uh, I, I think the member knows that, uh, you know, there's a huge demand, especially for, for certain, certain um, commodities within our parks like yurts and service campsites and things like that. And, uh, I think that uh, moving forward, we're going to consider we're going to continue to expand uh, those services uh, for for the good of uh, good of the province, so we can serve uh, our citizens to the best of our ability. The honourable member for Flin Flon. The reason I'm asking this line of questions, and certainly the minister and I have had conversations about such things, is is I want to ensure that. Manitobans have the best possible experience for camping but it can't be just for those people that have money it has to be the best possible experience for all Manitobans which is the, the whole basis of these questions and and I know already I, I alluded to the fact that you have to pay for firewood now are there other things within the parks 
that presently are provided at no charge that the minister is contemplating charging a fee for. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Well, I completely agree with the member that we want to keep our par parks cost effective so any Manitoban can visit a park and not feel like they, uh, you know, they're having money ripped out of their, their wallets and things like that. And, and to that end, our park fees are amongst the lowest in Canada right now. And uh, we want to continue keeping them low. There's certainly, um, there, there's certainly no indication here that, uh, you know, we're going to start charging for anything else at this point. I mean, there's n no, I would say no, there's nothing else. I mean, firewood, you talk about firewood, uh, but uh, I mean, I guess, uh, but our, again, uh, I, just, uh, I just think that Manitobans want the ability to enjoy our parks, like you say. It, it shouldn't be uh, something for the elite. It should be the average Manitoba that can go out and enjoy their park, and we want to continue to create better experiences in parks. Uh, for Manitobans, whether that be interpretive programs or more campsites, uh, more yurts, things like that. The demand is there and we want to satisfy that demand. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Does the Minister have any plans to sell off any of our publicly owned parks? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. I think the previous minister must have answered this question uh, a dozen times in the House, likely last year before I became minister, and the answer was always parks are not for sale. I've kind of added a tagline to that. I said, parks are not for sale, but they're open for business. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Well, we know that this government and prior to this minister being the minister responsible did lease a park to a private entity, which then immediately cost people more money to go and attend to. Campground, I stand corrected, it was a campground. Campground. So we know that that's already taken place. Does the minister contemplate leasing any other services entities within a park such as a campground to any private entity
The Honorable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we certainly have no plans to enter into any uh, commercial leases for campgrounds. The Honourable Member for Flint Flon. Uh, what about services or entities within the campgrounds? Does the Minister have any plans to uh, lease out or contract out uh, things like uh, boat docks or anything like that. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, sorry for taking so much time on that answer. I wanted to be clear on it, uh, that uh, we do have partnerships in place with certain, you know, private entities here in Manitoba for certain things, like uh, a campground, like you say. There's no plans to, uh, to um, uh, further that uh, at this point. I mean, we're always open to looking at... Uh, the possibility of um, you know expanding services for Manitobans at, at places where it makes sense so I mean there's no plans at, at this point but I think any of the partnerships we've created so far have made sense in terms of uh, 
you know, whether the, the campground be isolated and uh, better operated by a private operator, things like that. I mean, it's, uh, there's no great grandiose pl plan here to privatize anything, any, uh, any major portions of Manitoba parks at all. We want to keep them public. Uh, we want to expand our parks in terms of infrastructure expansion and improvements and uh, ensure that the public has a great experience when they're in these parks. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. So I know that in at least one park in Manitoba, a boat launch where local citizens used to go and launch their boat was free access. Then the leasey of the area put a chain across and then you had to go and pay the leasey to launch your boat at a boat launch that was built and paid for by the people of Manitoba. Does the minister see that as problematic and is it their plan to do more of that leasing that costs Manitobans more money when it didn't cost the leasee any money because the infrastructure was already there. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Can the member maybe uh, provide more detail on what uh, lake or what campground or park he's referring to at this point so I can, you know, try to find some details for you today or get back to you with an answer? Certainly. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Yes, I certainly can. It's Baker's Narrows Park, Lake Athabap. And the chain went up a couple of years ago. Uh, a goodly portion of people refused to pay, and rightfully so.
the Honorable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, um, you know, certainly we want uh, parks to be accessible here in Manitoba and, uh, you know, my staff's trying to find out uh, specifics about the one park you're talking about out of our 92 here where you say this incident is happening. Um, I'm not sure. I can't give you an answer at this point, but I don't know if you want to move on at this point and uh, we'll see what we can find before 5 o'clock. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Uh, the Minister can take it as an undertaking and get back to me whenever, but while he's in that process, perhaps he could have his staff look and see if there's any other instances of something similar to that taking place. And then, so then my next question would be, are there any plans to allow leases to limit access to things within a park like that other than what's already there is it is it the intention to allow a leasee to make money off of infrastructure that was put in place by the Manitoba government for Manitobans in order for that leasee to make a profit The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I do know I haven't been to, you know, a large percentage of these parks, which I hope to get to this summer, as many as I can, spring and summer. But, uh, you know, the parks I have been at, uh, you know, there's a concession stand in the park. We lease it out to an operator. You know, it's, it's, it was publicly built in a lot of cases, I'm sure. And it's leased out to them. They maintain and operate it for the season, for the length of their lease and things like that. So there, there are facilities in parks that are owned by, uh, by the Manitoba government, of course, and leased out. Um, so uh, the, there's certainly no plans to restrict, uh, um, to restrict uh, access or anything like that moving forward. We want parks to be open and enjoyable for all Manitobans. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. And unless uh, uh, it comes across as, as uh, any kind of condemnation of the people that are running Baker's Narrows Lodge, I just want to make sure that, that it's a matter of record that they're doing some pretty good things. They're trying to expand their business. They're trying to make sure that there's a better experience for people at Baker's Narrows Lodge than there's been for a while. They've, they've introduced several new and innovative things which I congratulate them for it, it's specific to one instant well maybe another one too but I'm sure they're only doing that which is allowed so if not then and I'd be shocked so I just wanted to make sure there was there was no uh, hint that I was trying to do say anything bad about the operators of that particular lodge because I, I think they are doing some good things so uh, does the minister have a list of the number of visits to each park in the last year
The Honorable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so you want to know how many visitors there was into a parks, right? So the latest number we have is 2021. We're showing 6.8 million visited provincial parks in Manitoba. And uh, that's based using uh, traffic counters, um, same as you count traffic on roads and things like that, an average of 3.5 people per, per vehicle to come up with that number. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. The Minister doesn't have a breakdown of park by park kind of visits that he could uh, undertake to provide? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think the member can appreciate that uh, we don't have gates at every provincial park here in Manitoba. There's 92 of them. I think the member can likely appreciate that uh, a large majority of those visits are at uh, some of our larger parks here in, uh, in um, eastern Manitoba and also perhaps in uh, central Manitoba, western Manitoba, that sort of thing. So. I mean, th this, is, uh, this is an estimate based on traffic counts at parks and things. Uh, I don't know that, uh, I mean, obviously our, our parks in the White Shell, things like that are extremely, extremely busy, you know, between uh, day traffic and camping traffic and things. So um, I don't have the numbers right at my fingertips here on each park. Like I say, it's an extrapolation based on traffic counts. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Thanks, uh, Minister, for that. Uh, is there any plans to create new parks, new campgrounds, or to expand any of the existing ones? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is where it gets exciting to be the minister responsible for parks. In Budget 2022-23, which is, uh, you know, this paragraph I'm going to read is included in the, this book here. Um, basically, the department uh, has developed a new multi-year Manitoba Park Strategic Investment Capital Plan with a capital investment of an initial $10 million beginning in this fiscal year. The increased funding is going to use, be used to improve infrastructure, construct new facilities, and provide the necessary equipment to support programs, tourism activities, and service in, in our parks uh, across the province. The highlights of the plan are going to include expansions to yurt villages and other glamping developments, campground infrastructure, electrification projects, significant trail improvement projects, and the redevelopment of the North White Shell Museum at Newtimit Lake. Um, further to that, I think if the member stays tuned, I'll give him a day's heads up when our announcement's going to be. We're planning an announcement here in May to announce our capital program here for 23-24. Uh, Many exciting uh, announcements. I know, uh, you know, our commercial operators, our, uh, our um, cottage owners associations and everything are very excited about uh, hearing the details of our announcement and I'm sure you'll want to pay close attention to the announcement as well. 
The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. So just to go back for a minute or two to the memorandum of understanding that the department has signed with uh, the Cottage Cabin Owners Association, can the minister share any information on what is in that memorandum of understanding or better yet, supply a copy of said memorandum? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. That document is, is publicly available on the Manitoba Parks website if the member would like to go and take a look at the, uh, I think it's you know five or six pages long. So I think I summarized it before that we're gonna work in collaboration with, uh, with the Cottage Owners Association and cottage owners across Manitoba on um, you know lease fees, service fees, things like that. And um, like I say, it's, it's working together, it's collaborating, it's ensuring that uh, you know, the government has the best interests of the cottage owners at heart, with the cottage owners having an understanding that uh, you know, provincial parks are, are treasured uh, um, entities here in Manitoba and that uh, they are, they've always been willing to pay their fair share of fees and uh, lease fees and service fees here in Manitoba. So it's gonna be an open and transparent process uh, that's basically what the memorandum states, and uh, I look forward to work on this over the next, uh, you know, the next couple years to come to uh, a, a satisfactory agreement so that uh, both sides are extremely happy. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Does this memorandum apply only to cottages, cabins that are in parks, or does it apply to any cottage cabin that's on Crown land. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the agreement was signed with the Manitoba Provincial Parks Cottage Owners Association. It applies to cottages in provincial parks. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Are all cottage cabin owners associations in the province associated with that group? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. So the member is certainly correct that not every uh, cottage owner is a member of an association here in Manitoba, but the MOU sets out a framework for ongoing discussions with MPPCOA representatives towards the determination and implementation of new cottager lease and service fees. And this process will also include public engagement opportunities for all provincial park cottagers and cottage associations to have a say in, in the development of uh, any new fee models. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. So currently, I know there are some cottage owners associations that are not a part of the provincial association. So does this memorandum of understanding affect those associations, even though they haven't been a part of the discussions or signing of said memorandum of understanding? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Oh, all I, I, I guess I want to reiterate that the, all the MLU does is spell out that uh, you know we're both sides are going to work in a in an open, transparent manner to ensure that any proposed increase to uh, to lease fees or to service fees for cottage owners in Manitoba, whether whether they're a member of the association or not of MPPCOA, that is done in a fair and transparent manner, and that's where we're going to have public engagement with uh, you know cottage owners that aren't part of uh, an association that has membership in MPPCOA. Um, so um, 
I, I guess I think MPP COA represents a majority of cottage owners in Manitoba, I'm assuming. And I think that, uh, you know, but uh, we don't want anybody to be left out. We want to make sure that everybody's fully informed before any, any changes are made to the lease and service fee models here in Manitoba. The Honourable Member for Flintfont. So there are some cottage cabin owners associations that are not within provincial parks. Will there be any change to their Crown land lease fees or, or, or anything of that nature? Or are they going to be treated differently? Is there going to be some open and transparent uh, discussions with some of those associations that are outside of parks? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Well, this, this MOU just applies to cottages within provincial parks at this point. There's been no discussions about uh, cottage developments on Crown lands or anything at that sp this point. Um, you know, there was, uh, there was a need to, to come to this MOU um, based on, um, you know, the, the lease fee arrangements um, had basically expired and we needed to come up with a new model, or we wanted to come up with a new model, I guess is a better way to put it, with, with cottagers. Ooh. Bless you. <laughs> um, so, you know, we want to we want to we want to work with these people in an open and transparent model, knowing that we need them in parks and they need to work in 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 conjunction with parks to ensure that uh, you know they have the services they need as well. So, um, um, like I say, I'm lo I'm looking forward to our discussions moving forward. This agreement was, you know. It, it took a while to hammer it out, but uh, you know we, we did it, and uh, everybody's satisfied and looking forward to discussions moving forward. The Honourable Member for Flintflon. I just want to clarify that knowing that there are some cabin owner associations that are outside parks, there's also individual cabin owners in particular that aren't part of an association that are outside parks, there's remote cabins that are on Crown lands and all those kind of things, is the intent that this memorandum of understanding will somehow apply to them somewhere in the future even though they haven't been a part of the discussion. If, if for example, the, the uh, group that you've been talking to decides that, well, they're going to increase lease fees, does that mean that it'll automatically apply to ones that aren't part of an association, aren't in a park, have different services that, that may not be supplied by the province, like maybe some of them don't have, they don't have roads, so there's no such thing as snow clearing or grading or things like that. Other ones, through their own association, pay for those type of services without any cost to the government. It's, so is, is there any intent to include all of those type of entities into this memorandum of understanding or whatever comes out of that memorandum? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Um, I, I just want to make it clear to the member that this agreement is an MOU with the Manitoba Provincial Park Cabin Owners Association. It has no effect on any, anything outside the park and any cottage developments or anything like that. This MOU is strictly to, to talk about lease and service fees within provincial parks in Manitoba. Any associations or cottagers that aren't members of MPPCOA will still be consulted as part of this open consultation process before any decisions are made. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. I thank the Minister for that. Um, one of the things that I'd asked about, uh, and maybe I didn't get the fulsome answer to it, was about, uh, uh, and maybe I didn't ask the question right, because I can't even find it now, so. 
It was about uh, any other areas being designated as protected for parks, or is there any plan to look at other areas that aren't presently designated as parks or anything like that, or protected areas, I guess? <laughs> The Honorable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just ask the member to bear with me here as I read a, a document to him, and you know, I think we'll explain uh, what we're trying to do. Um, so Manitoba is dedicated to working with organizations, indigenous communities, and other partners to build and maintain a network of protected and conserved areas to conserve biodiversity across the province with associated ecosystems and cultural values over the long term. Manitoba has had a long-term commitment to establish uh, a network of protected areas. Uh, the, the province became the first jurisdiction in Canada in 1990 to commit to permanently protecting its diverse landscapes. Manitoba's current network of protected and conserved areas is just over 7.2 million hectares, or approximately 11.1% of Manitoba. My department is also working with other jurisdictions and levels of government to collaboratively advance area-based conservation efforts in Manitoba and across the country. Uh, Canada signed the, the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework at the UN's 15th uh, Convention of the Parties in Montreal in December 2022, committing to conserving 25% of land, freshwater and marine areas by 2025 and 30% of each by 2030. Uh, Manitoba will certainly support Canada where it can, can as we determine goals aligned with the province's need. We are working with partners to identify other effective area-based conservation measures, uh, which is OECMs. Uh, they're managed in ways that achieve positive and sustained long-term outcomes for conservation of biodiversity on site and may include associated socioeconomic and other locally relevant values. We use various legislation to make protected areas in Manitoba based on what is being protected and why. So protected areas are made by order and council, including ecological reserves, provincial parks, wildlife management areas, provincial forests, and traditional use planning areas. In January 2023, as I mentioned earlier, our government designated the first ever provincially significant peatlands in Manitoba to ensure the biodiversity of Muswa Meadows and Fish Lake Fen. Wildlife management areas, which include both protected and unprotected portions, encompass approximately 2 million hectares of valuable wildlife habitat throughout Manitoba. And as the member knows, WMAs also play an important role in biodiversity conservation. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. I thank the Minister for that rather lengthy answer that didn't really answer the question but you know I realize it's getting late in the day and the minister's tired and he wants to get out of here and it would have been nice to be able to wrap up today I'm not sure we will now I, well I do have a whole bunch of questions that I could spend the next month asking the minister about when it comes to wildfires and wildfire suppression and uh, 
Does the minister have a trail strategy, and if so, when will it be implemented? Yeah. The Honorable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. We're certainly working on a trail strategy here in Manitoba. Uh, as the member will know, uh, I think that uh, you know we've we've certainly been working with Snowman on snowmobile trails and ATV Manitoba on trails. And I think the, maybe the members uh, alluding to more walking trails, biking trails, things like that. So that's certainly uh, you know uh, a part of our. Um, are part of our plan. I think back in 2020, um, you know, our government provided a historic $10 million investment to promote and build trail networks throughout a new endowment fund here in Manitoba. So that works continue. Uh, in 2022, 30 projects were funded and uh, we look forward to more good work on trails moving forward. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. At this time, there's no more questions, so I suggest we move on to resolution. Okay. Let's go to the next page. Hearing no further questions, we will now proceed to consideration of the resolutions. At this point, we will allow the virtual members to unmute their mics so they can respond to the questions. I don't believe we have any. Okay. Resolution 25.2. Resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $20,241,000 for natural resources and northern development, stewardship and resource development for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2024. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 25.3, resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $38,123,000 for natural resources and northern development, resource management and protection for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2024. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 25.4, resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $51,299,000 for natural resources and northern development, Manitoba Wildfire Service for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2024. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 25.5, resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $35,830,000 for the natural resources and northern development, parks and trails for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2024. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 25.6, resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $15,949,000 for natural resources and northern development capital assets for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2024. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. The last item to be considered for these estimates is item 
one bracket A, the minister's salary contained in resolution 25.1. At this point, we request the minister staff leave the table for the consideration of this last item. The floor is now open for questions. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. I move that line item 25.1 bracket A be amended so that the Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development salary be reduced to $21,000. Yeah, how can a guy live on that? It's below poverty line. I got to put a sign on it's my board. It has been moved by the Honourable Member for Flynn Flon that line item 25.1 bracket A be amended so the Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development salary be reduced to $21,000. The motion is, it, is in order. Are there any questions or comments on this motion? Okay. Is the committee ready for the question? Shall the motion pass? I hear a no. All those in favor of this motion, please say aye. aye. All those opposed to the motion, please say nay. nay. In my opinion, the nays have it. The, the motion is accordingly defeated. Resolution 25.1, resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $2,811,000 for natural resources and northern development, finance and shared services for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2024. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. This completes the estimates of the, depart uh, of the Department of Natural Resources and Northern Development. The hour being 4.59, what is the will of the committee? Committee rise. Perfect. <laughs>